Hey everybody! So we've learnt about natural selection so far and basically we've been suggesting that it's the only way that species can evolve and that populations can change. But actually since the 1850s when Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace came up with the theory of natural selection, scientists have figured out that actually there's three main processes that cause evolution, not just natural selection. So these are the three processes we're going to talk about today in the video. So three processes cause evolution. The first one obviously is natural selection and we've learnt a lot about it already. The second one is called genetic drift. And the last one is called gene flow. So these three processes all combine together to make evolution happen. And in some populations one will have will have a greater effect than another. Um, and one of them might not even occur at all in a certain population. But these are the three possible ways that species can evolve and that populations can evolve. Okay, so let's quickly recap natural selection. So remember, this is the process where um, in a population, some traits will be more beneficial so they'll help an individual to survive more and so that means the fittest individuals will tend to survive and they'll tend to have more offspring than the less fit individuals. So the fittest individuals survive and so that means that the beneficial traits they're going to increase over time in the population. So beneficial traits increase and obviously the negative traits will reduce over time because those individuals are less fit and they've got less chance of passing on their genes and their traits to their offspring. So in the example here, we've got snails on the beach and obviously the brown snails are the fittest because they blend in to the environment better and they're less able to be seen by the eagles that are their predators. So over time, there'll be fewer and fewer coloured snails because those negative traits will be lost and the brown snails are more likely to survive and pass on their genes. So then most of the snails will end up being brown in the population. So they're the fittest. So we know how natural selection works. We've talked a lot about the process in detail. But now we'll compare that to genetic drift. So we've got the same example with snails here. And genetic drift is all about random chances and random events that can happen to a population. So let's go back to our starting population of snails here. Um, if by chance a disease happened to kill off the snails living in this area here and they happen to be brown snails and then maybe um, a rock slide from the cliffs happens to land over here and it crushes these snails over here so these are all random events then suddenly there's the red and the green snail down here they are in a higher percentage in the population so just by chance, even though the red snail isn't the fittest, it might happen to have a good breeding season and it might actually end up passing on its genes to quite a few offspring. And so we might end up with the result here where we have lots and lots of red snails 
even though they're not the fittest in the population. And so that's called genetic drift. And genetic drift essentially is random. So we can say that it's changes in a population due to random events. So like I said, then you can have natural disasters, like floods and bushfires. You can have diseases that kill random individuals, just like coronavirus is just happens to target random people who are unfortunate. And so that means that random individuals might increase and that certain traits will increase even if they're not the fittest. And the key here is that beneficial traits and negative traits don't matter in genetic drift. So in this example, the coloured snail shell, that's not going to protect you from a rock slide and it's not going to protect you from a disease. Um, and that's true for a lot of other traits in the population. Okay, the other important thing to think about for genetic drift is it's all about percentages. So let's look at another example. Um, here we've got an imaginary population, and let's just say this is fur colour of these individuals in the population. So in the first one, we've got a really large population. This is about um, over a hundred individuals in this one. Greater than 100. In the second one here, we've got, this is around 50. So let's just say n equals 50, n being the number in the population. Let's fix this one up too. And then we've got a really small population over here. This one only has 10 individuals living in this population. Okay, so let's have a look at the effects of genetic drift on these three populations. So the example we'll use here is a bushfire. And we're imagining that the circle here is representing the whole habitat range of this species. So for example, let's say a bushfire comes through the area and it actually destroys and kills every individual living in this part of the habitat. So for a huge population with more than a hundred individuals, there's still a wide range of traits and a huge variation in the survivors over here. So the survivors um, still have high variation. So that means natural selection can then keep working to select the, the fittest individuals from there. Um, in this population here with 50 individuals, let's say a bushfire happens again, it happens to kill all these unfortunate individuals over here. And again, in the surviving population, pretty much the percentages of each trait are staying pretty similar. We've still got every colour, and there's more blues than the others, but that's what we had in the starting population too. But if we have a really small population like this one, where there's only 10 individuals, if a bushfire comes through this area, and just by pure chance, it's now killed off the only blue and green um, fur coloured individuals. So the survivors suddenly are only red. So they have a really low variation now in the population and actually they've got no variation because they're only red. So you can see the smaller the population the greater effect that random chance has 
and that random events um, can cause a big change on the population. And that's the really important thing to remember with genetic drift, that um, natural selection happens in larger populations more, but in really small populations, genetic drift actually has a much bigger effect on how that population is going to evolve. So genetic drift has a large effect on small populations. All right, so that's natural selection and genetic drift. The last way that evolution can happen is through gene flow. This one's probably the most simple out of all. So gene flow is just when we have individuals that move out of the population or new individuals that migrate into the population. And that means they're going to be bringing in new alleles and new variation into the population. Or if they're emigrating out, they're taking away variation. So gene flow is it's the transfer of genetic information from one population to another. Transfer of genetic info from one population to another. And it's caused by migration. Okay, so here's a few examples. Here we've got a population of green beetles. There's no variation here, so there's not going to be any natural selection happening. But if a few beetles from the beige beetle population happen to migrate across, they'll be introducing their genes and their alleles into the gene pool over here. And that means that evolution through natural selection can start happening. Then we've got the birds over here. So on one side of the river, we've got these birds here, which all have pink underbellies. And you can see there's no variation in this population at all. They've all got, um, they're all homozygous and they've all got dominant alleles. But if a few of these birds from the blue population come over, suddenly they're bringing in some new alleles. And in this case, they're recessive alleles. And so as these birds start to breed with the rest of the population, they'll be combining their genes together and the gene pool will increase in variation. So that's basically what gene flow is. It increases or it reduces variation and that helps the other two types of evolution to occur. Alright, something interesting to think about before we finish is how humans have changed our gene flow. So initially, at the moment, we, we're pretty sure that humans originated out of Africa, in Eastern Africa, and as we evolved and moved out, human, different groups of humans moved over to Europe, they moved to Asia, down through Indonesia, into Australia, and then across um, they could actually travel across the ocean to Alaska because it was an ice age and then they colonized the Americas as well and then those different groups of humans started to evolve separately and they're the different races of humans that we know today but since the um, evolution since modern society started and we have global transport suddenly we can just hop on a plane we can fly across the whole world. We can move to another country really easily. So that means there's a huge amount of gene flow in the human population today. So whatever evolution had started in Europe and Asia 
among populations that were really isolated. Now we're basically considering the whole human population in the world to be one population. So we've basically stopped our human evolution into separate species. So we have a high rate of gene flow. And so we've stopped our speciation, basically. Okay. So they're the three, three different types of mechanisms that evolution can happen by. Natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow.